Okay, so thank you very much for having me, guys. Uh, pleasure to be here. We are going to talk today about understanding DeFi and risk. Uh, my name is Justus. I'm the presenter today. Uh, I come from an economics and politics background. I uh, have worked in the finance industry and in the tech industry before. And then I've joined Chainalysis, a blockchain analytics company, uh, just about um, uh, 10 months ago. So I uh, have gotten a chance to, to get to know a lot in the blockchain space since then. Very excited to bring some of the insights uh, with me here today in order to share them with you. So this, let's have a look at the agenda. Um, we are going to cover today the DeFi world, uh, having a bit of an overview of the space, what type of economic activity is happening. The next up, we will take a look at when do people actually entering the DeFi space and uh, what are some of the activities the people are doing as they're entering it. Then we will move on to have a look at how is the uh, transaction on chain evolving in light of decentralized versus centralized exchanges, um, taking a look at some of the patterns and what's driving these changes. Next up, we take a look at DeFi applications, lending and staking, um, in order to us to get some uh, overview as to how this space is evolving, which I argue is one of the most popular spaces in the DeFi world. Then we're going to give an overview about DeFi risk and uh, crime, giving us uh, some idea as to how large the DeFi risk and crime area actually is, as well as some of the trends looking at rug pulls, as well as some of the DeFi crime that we've seen in the recent months and years uh, happening. Then I also brought a little framework with me, uh, something that's not scientific by any means, uh, but hopefully some help in order to get an understanding how you can assess risk from a potential scam token. And then finally, we're going to dive into a little case study, uh, which hopefully is going to give you guys a, a couple of smiles and uh, also some lessons learned uh, what not to do and how to identify a scam token. And then we're all going to wrap this up together uh, with a nice little conclusion. So lots of content, uh, hopefully interesting insights for you guys and uh, looking forward uh, to taking you guys through it. So uh, the DeFi world is a bit of a strange one in the sense that it's all happening, as we heard multiple times, on public blockchains, uh, permissionless blockchains as such. So anyone can see any transactions as they're occurring. Um, however, getting an overview as to like where all the economic activities occurring uh, is something that can be quite difficult, as was all on transaction view as opposed to on the service level. So. Um, let's take a look at the slide here. Uh, we see the number of transfers and the value that uh, each of these service categories have received. So it's giving us a good um, overview in terms of which activities have been the most popular ones in the DeFi space to put things into context where most of the activities really are occurring. You can see that DAOs um, down here uh, have received billions in governance tokens, um, so something that has arisen in the year, recent years, uh, as we heard from Aave uh, and MakerDAO um, being some of the big names in the game. However, if you compare this to some of the other activities occurring in DeFi, they're actually not as significant as you might think. Um, when we take a look at the top right corner, um, we see up here staking and lending contracts. Um, we're going to take a look later on as to what's driving this huge amount of investment following in these protocols. But you can see that staking is actually not as popular as you might think in terms of uh, comparing it to lending contracts. Lending contracts is really one of the categories that's receiving the highest amount of volume. Uh, not quite as many transactions as staking, uh, but still the volume uh, is definitely higher. We can also see that token smart contracts uh, are starting to um, be one of the biggest uh, areas where funds are flowing. So we're mostly talking about stable coins here, uh, being some of the categories that um, DeFi has, I think, found a really good use case in, in order to avoid some of the fluctuations in terms of the value. We also see decentralized exchange contracts on the top right corner for, um, from your perspective. Um, so DEX is really here receiving funds. And then, of course, what we heard a lot in the conference here is NFTs um, that bringing a huge number of users into the ecosystem. And also, there's a huge number of providers out there uh, that have attracted a large amount of volume. So this gives us a bit of an understanding as to how the ecosystem actually looks overall and where most of the economic activity is occurring. So where does the journey start? Um, well, the DeFi journey starts when people create a wallet and entering the DeFi space uh, with that particular wallet. Maybe give me a show of hands. Who of you has a wallet and used the DeFi protocol? Yeah, oh, well, so that's, that's quite a good uh, percentage here. 
Uh, most people in the audience have done so. I'm not sure like where you've entered the DeFi space, but you can see here on the bottom, gaming and entertainment used to be the first entry point for a lot of people when they entered the DeFi space. So arguably, they didn't even quite know that this is a particular DeFi as such because it's gaming uh, on the blockchain rather than uh, a DeFi activity as such. Next up, we have NFTs that have actually become the entry point for a lot of people. Um, as already mentioned, a lot of new users have entered the ecosystem because of NFTs, um, which has been something great to see, but perhaps not the typical DeFi use case you might think of. Next up, uh, for me quite surprising, is um, the aspect around lending protocols, um, which have been the first most common protocol that people venture, venture into. Um, lending protocols that we've seen in terms of the value received uh, is one of the most popular ones there, and actually people venturing into it just over three months after they created the wallet. So in a fairly short amount of, pe uh, of a time, people are already willing to interact with these type of protocols in order to start uh, earning money in the DeFi ecosystem. Next up, we have cross-chain bridges. Um, cross-chain bridges are probably a bit more complicated uh, compared to some of the other use cases, uh, requiring a lot more user experience and willingness to actually do some research in order to understand and avoid losing your funds by accident, by perhaps uh, misinteracting with a particular cross-chain. And then finally, interesting enough, DEXs here on the very top um, is actually the category that user venture into at the very end um, when they have some more experience in order to understand really what what they're doing with the decentralized exchange as to how to also work with it in a way uh, that allows them to take advantage of this particular protocol. So um, let's take a deeper look at centralized exchanges versus decentralized exchanges. We had some interesting discussion earlier today around uh, what's the future role of decentralized exchanges and centralized exchanges. Um, the panel outlining that we see perhaps more of a merge of the ecosystem together. And uh, when we take a look at the transaction data um, on, on chain, we can actually see that centralized exchanges have been falling behind in terms of the transaction volume versus decentralized exchanges. So if we compare here the uh, blue line of the decentralized exchanges versus the centralized exchanges, we can see that since 2018, uh, where the crypto summer was, uh, centralized exchanges have been dominating the space. But then in the recent high of the crypto summer 21, decentralized exchanges have massively dominated on-chain transaction volume. We're talking here 175 billion for centralized exchanges versus 224 billion for decentralized exchanges. So a um, critical mass that has really uh, evolved in decentralized exchanges and uh, that uh, the numbers I think speaking for themselves showing that decentralized exchanges is really where most of the activity is occurring as opposed to uh, decentralized exchanges. So when we look at this in percentages, I think it becomes even more clear that since September 2020, we've seen over 50% of the uh, transaction volume happening on decentralized exchanges, and that trend has uh, evolved to being over 80% uh, in the summer 21, around June, um, and now we gone back to like a rough proportion of 45 to 55 percent. Um, but you can see from the mo momentum that decentralized exchanges have gained uh, a massive dominance in the space and arguably there's been a change in, in pattern in the sense that uh, users that once went to a decentralized exchange start appreciating the cost efficiency of around half the cost of a centralized exchange and also the ability to maintain custody of the funds because as we've seen in the recent past when centralized lenders such as Celsius or other other players uh, have shown up the system. People are really worried of losing their cryptocurrency and therefore also being more uh, cautious in order to safeguard it themselves. So DeFi, of course, is a lot more than decentralized exchanges. As we've seen, decentralized exchanges are actually the space when people venturing into it only at the very end, sort of after they created the wallet, one of the most advanced use cases they have been creating. But DeFi is about staking and lending in order to create like more consistent returns, arguably at lower risk than perhaps some traditional finance uh, applications. So when we take a look uh, at both of these uh, types of investments, we're talking about protocols where you send your cryptocurrency funds in order to then be able to obtain this yield. Staking, either by putting it to a staking uh, pool, or if you're fortunate enough to have over, for instance, 32 ESA, you can also send it directly to the protocol to be able to validate blocks uh, and obtain the staking rewards from doing so. The lending protocols is similar, just in the sense that you send your funds to a lending protocol and then the lending protocol allows you to earn a certain yield on that particular capital you provided. So 
it's 66 billion that are currently staked up across all blockchains. And I think the most interesting part of this slide is to see that Ethereum is leading the, the way very, very strongly with over 30 billion being staked in Ethereum. And if we compare to all the other uh, um, blockchains here, Solana, Cardano, Polkadot, they're nowhere near the market capitalization in terms of the value being staked in these blockchains uh, as Ethereum. So it, it's a very dominated space. But then when we actually switch the perspective around and take a look at the potential staking yield you can obtain, Ethereum is actually the lowest. 4.6% is what you obtain on Ethereum stake capital, while some other privacy-focused blockchains, such as Secret, give you around 27%. So you might ask yourself, why is it the case that people are still investing in Ethereum even though they're obtaining the lowest uh, staking reward? Well, our sort of um, assumption is that people really value safety these days. And Ethereum is the biggest player out there, and Ethereum is the one that uh, people trust and know that it has a future also tomorrow. So people are more willing to take in a lower yield and therefore having their capital more safeguarded than potentially other blockchains. But well, quite interesting uh, from, from that perspective. So staking uh, is, of course, a bit uh, less reliable than lending because staking also always uh, relies on the ability of you being nominated to uh, the ability to um, validate a new block and thereby also reward, uh, being rewarded for doing so. Lending protocols, on the other side, give you a consistent return uh, independent of that chance of being nominated. And we can see the value that has been flowing into the lending protocols has risen since the uh, sort of mid of 2020 continuously, again, uh, reaching peak levels of over uh, um, 100 uh, billion here uh, in 2021. And we've seen huge fluctuations in the system uh, as the uh, market has been evolving and, and prices have been going up and down, and then a massive significant drop sort of by the beginning of the year. Uh, again, some of the uh, shocks we've seen in the ecosystem are most likely to be accountable for. And we heard that the trust in DeFi uh, seems to be gone. It seems to be the case that people are really not sure whether they can trust DeFi and, and whether it has a future in terms of their willing to, uh, willingness to invest into the space. But we see a slow growth again in the early days of 2022, so it seems like there's some hope left for DeFi to make a comeback, but yet again, the volatility, I think, is, is quite clear on this slide. So where does the money actually go? All these funds that are being poured into these lending protocols, all the funds uh, that people are uh, either providing as lending or borrowing. Well, we can see on the slide that it's a fairly closed ecosystem with 84% of the funds that come from lending protocols staying in the DeFi ecosystem. So what that means is it means people that are borrowing or lending funds on DeFi also want to do things in DeFi with it. So you can see that 38% goes to DEXs as liquidity provision to earn additional yields on it. We see token smart contracts, people buying stable coins with this particular collateral they have been obtaining, or also sending it to mining, so potentially to stake some additional cryptocurrency, or to actually uh, reinvest it in another lending protocol, uh, so trying to earn the spread between the borrowed cost and the yield they can obtain for lending their particular capital. Exchanges, 12.7%, so a very small fraction. Um, really giving us, again, the confirmation that people don't use the money to buy things out of the DeFi world. They really want to reinvest the capital they have been borrowing uh, in that DeFi space. So now that we've gotten an idea, where do people invest? Where do they send the funds? What do they do with the money? And what are some of the returns you could be obtaining? Let's take a look at the DeFi risk and crime categories. Uh, unfortunately, um, crypto crime has been on the rise. Um, we have seen uh, very low transaction volumes in terms of the overall transaction that we see in cryptocurrency, but yet cryptocurrency uh, crimes are on the rise. I really just want you to focus here on the categories stolen funds and scams, those are dominating the space, and we've seen an incredible amount of 7.7 .7 billion uh, being obtained from addresses associated with scamming. And we've seen 3.2 billion um, being associated with stolen funds. And out of these 3.2 billion, 2.2 billion just in DeFi. So it really shows that DeFi has become a focused point of the attacks. And the amount of increase is 516% in stolen funds. And we'll see later on that when we look at DeFi specifically, we're talking about thousands of percents. 
So rug pulls is something that's talked a lot about, um, and I just wanted to give you guys an idea as to how that uh, compares to the overall amount that's been obtained from uh, um, potential uh, scams. And we can see that in 2020, uh, it's perhaps a bit hard to see on the slide, but it's just over 1% here in 2020, whilst in 2021, we're talking around 37% of the overall scamming value being associated with rug pulls. So a huge rise uh, in the recent years and um, 2.8 billion uh, at the figure. What's a rug pull? Most of you probably know it, but if someone creates an NFT or a new token, uh, makes a big value promise on it, but then essentially ends up just pulling the rug under your feet away, uh, running away with the funds by either um, draining the liquidity pool or just uh, taking the funds that they've uh, been sent by the investors and running away with them. So here we can see it uh, very nicely that exchanges and private wallets were the primary point of attack. Uh, and then over the recent years, uh, we've seen DeFi here becoming the, the main focal point of attacks with a 1,330% increase. Uh, I think all, all of us probably wish that we saw this kind of uh, growth in our portfolio, uh, but unfortunately we see this more in the crypto crime category here. And DeFi has become really the area that all the criminals want to uh, focus on because it's so profitable for them uh, to actually uh, obtain the funds from these type of protocols. So. Um, how do criminals manage to obtain these funds? Well, we see code exploits and uh, flash loan attacks being the sort of half of the um, um, reasons why these funds are being obtained. Uh, and I think that is quite interesting, uh, considering about how smart contracts have become so popular in the space, but yet criminal actors are able to exploit these. Um, and what's even more telling is when we look at the amount of code exploits that happened, despite the fact they're being audited within one year, we can see that 30% of all code exploits happened to codes that were audited within a year. So in other words, even though they were audited, they were still exploited. When we look at flash loans, we're looking at 73%. They've been audited and they had 73% still getting uh, attacked and basically exploited by these criminal actors. So it shows us that in terms of maturity to, uh, for smart contract security, we still have a long way to go, and smart, security, smart contract security is nowhere near where it should really be in order for us to thrive uh, and be able to build the ecosystem uh, more securely. You will also see here that uh, the security breach, so in other words, when people obtain private keys to be able to send the funds, have been rising uh, significantly in uh, 2022. That's partly because of the Ronin Bridge hack, uh, where uh, around 600 million were illicitly obtained. So uh, of course, these trends come and go, but the key point here is really that smart contract security is a problem and uh, criminal actors take advantage of it. So who is affected? Um, we see infrastructure services, we see lending protocols uh, being the majority of victims. Um, probably, as you can imagine, because these are highly profitable to exploit, especially in flow, flash loan attacks, we see that flash loan attacks made up around 900 million um, that were illicitly obtained. So again, very uh, um, a large space where these funds are being drained from. Okay, so... Um, now that we've gotten a bit of an overview of the DeFi space and the DeFi risk space, uh, we're now going to take a bit of a look as to how we can evaluate whether we're dealing with a scammy token or not. This is not scientific by any means, but it's a bit of a framework that we put together based on what I uh, was able to uh, configure with my friends from the investigations team as well as with Vinci Analysis more broadly. So here we have the uh, criteria, we have the sense, the value, reputation, and trading. Um, so it's just a nice framework for you to check basically whether this token uh, is uh, worth it or not. Um, you just should be asking yourself questions like, you know, does it make sense? Uh, is it just another ESC20 token? What's really the value proposition? And don't just fall for any sort of hype uh, as we'll see in the case study in a moment. Then the value, is it too good to be true? Uh, I think in a lot of cases it is. That's why people are falling from it. Uh, and then also the developer, you should be scrutinizing the developer thoroughly. Uh, you shouldn't just give a random person on the internet money. And if you do so, uh, please do your research uh, before doing so, so you can verify that these people are actually capable of delivering something valuable. And also check the trading, so have a look at the size of the liquidity pool. 
So the case study I brought, um, we're going to dive right into it, just some basics. So there's externally uh, owned accounts and smart contract accounts. Externally owned accounts are the ones that we own as individuals. We can sign transactions and we can send a code to the blockchain in order to store it. And then we have contract accounts. Those are the accounts where the smart contract data is actually stored. They cannot be uh, triggered on their own, but we need an externally owned account that triggers these smart contracts and to be able to interact with it. Then there's the contract creator. Why would we be interested in finding out who the contract creator is? Well, that's essentially the person that's uploading the code to the blockchain, and therefore is also the person that potentially is behind the scam if we're falling for it. Uh, so this could be someone that we could be reporting to exchanges or financial intelligence units to actually help fight the crypto crime and make the whole crypto ecosystem safer. Uh, I know from a personal experience a lot of people don't do this because they just think it's pointless anyway, but uh, hopefully I can illustrate that that's not the case. So this is quite a funny one, I think, because it's so poorly executed. Uh, the sad truth is that this scammer has been managed to obtain 220 ETH with such a poorly executed scam that I think it's almost scary to show us how easy it is to scam people. We see a Tesla X token. Tesla, the spelling, it's already is, uh, kind of uh, off. Yeah? It doesn't even fit the real Tesla. We see that uh, the scammer tells us we're dealing with a virtual currency, so clearly didn't do his homework that we have a cryptocurrency rather than a virtual currency. And then telling us that there's 100 million yen worth uh, to be given away, uh, which seems like a lot, but then actually when we take a look at the liquidity pool, we can see that it's just $8 in the liquidity pool. So anyone who would have like, clicked a bit around and would have quickly found out that this is nowhere near uh, where it has to be in order to uh, have such a value claim. And then of course, um, we can see Elon Musk apparently being involved and apparently Tesla was meant to acquire this token. You may wonder why that is the case uh, and why Tesla wouldn't just create the token on their own. Uh, but essentially, bottom line here is, you know, just trying to uh, um, awaken this fear of missing out. People are just uh, trying to get excited about the project because, you know, as, so, as soon as Elon Musk is involved, uh, there's a chance of perhaps making money. So uh, this is the case study um, that we will just quickly run through. Uh, it is going to allow us now to identify the smart uh, contract. So in this case, the uh, uh, token smart contract where the ESC20 token uh, is uh, held, or the balances I keep track of is a better way of phrasing it. And then we're also going to take a look at how we can find the contract creator so that if you are getting scammed or you know people that have been gotten gun scammed, you know how to identify who is behind the scam, at least in, in, in terms of the cryptocurrency address. So let me just quickly do this. So we're just going to go on Etherscan, which is like a, a regular block explorer for Ethereum. And I just look for the Tesla X token here. So we see the token tracker. We see the maximal supply of tokens that have been uh, given here. We see the amount of holders, um, which I can also click on here uh, to actually see who's holding the token. And we can already see a large amount sits with a particular address. We can see here liquidity deposition, uh, where the particular scammer had sent some of the funds that we've seen on Uniswap to the actual uh, uh, exchange to make it look like it's a legit uh, token that's being traded. And then uh, if we wanted to find the contract, we find here the smart, uh, token smart contract address. And if I click on it, I can already see the um, EFA scan telling me the contract creator. But in case uh, you weren't seeing this, you could also just click on the transactions here and then find the very first transactions to find the uh, contract creator, which is here at the very bottom. So here we can see this is the address where the scammer had essentially uploaded the uh, contract to the blockchain. So hopefully this gives you guys a bit of a, a feel of how to do some basic blockchain analysis and how you could be identifying the token smart contract and the contract creator. So these are the answers here that we just uh, worked through together. And uh, I just wanted to quickly show you this graph. This is what we can do at Chainalysis uh, to be able to see where the funds coming from, where they're going to, and the reason why I'm urging you to report the potential uh, um, um, contract creator and the smart contract that's been used to create the ESC20 token is that we can see here that actually most of the funds came from an exchange and went to an exchange afterwards. So there are some chances that you could be recovering your funds uh, in case you are going to go ahead and report it. 
So overall, I just want to wrap up by saying we've seen tremendous growth over 912% in the DeFi space in the recent year. Uh, I think that's uh, hopefully putting us all in an optimistic mode. There's a lot uh, that can be achieved and a lot of growth uh, where we can be part of. But at the same time, uh, we see the ecosystem being uh, very closed. Um, so it's very much an ecosystem that builds on top of each other. And crypto crime is something that's still happening, but we can all do our contribution to try uh, avoid it by not falling for things like the Tesla X token uh, and uh, also doing our part by reporting these scamming uh, addresses to law enforcement or even exchanges to be able to freeze the funds. And therefore, blockchain analysis can make the blockchain ecosystem a lot safer. Thank you very much. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, please let me know.